Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for TechSoup for Libraries webinar, Technology Planning Tips for Small Libraries. My name is Crystal, and I'll be your host. Today we have two guests who will share their experience developing technology plans for their libraries. They'll also share tips and advice from the IT management and library director perspectives. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to share. We'll be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting today. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We'll be tracking your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them at designated Q&A sections. All of your chat comments do come only to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we'll forward them back out with the entire group. You don't need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number in your confirmation email or that Becky has shared in the chat. If you have any technical issues, please send us a message and we'll do our best to assist you. This webinar is being recorded and it will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you are called away from the webinar or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of this webinar later. You will receive an archive email within 24 hours that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you are tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. We have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so please join us in the conversation there. TechSoup connects nonprofits, charities, libraries, and foundations with tech products and services, as well as information so that you can make informed decisions about technology. And since 1987, TechSoup has distributed over 11 million technology donations to over 200,000 nonprofit organizations, libraries, and charities in over 60 countries worldwide. Last year in 2014, the TechSoup donation program distributed over 61,000 products to libraries for a savings of over $19 million. TechSoup offers a wide range of software, hardware, and services through their product donation program. This includes tech consulting services with Tech Impact, software from Microsoft, and refurbished computers. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. Okay, so now we're ready to begin. And so thanks again for joining us for today's TechSoup for Libraries webinar, Technology Planning Tips for Small Libraries. Now whether you are a small or a large library, today you'll hear from us with examples, tips, and advice for developing a technology plan for your library. Technology planning doesn't have to be a painful process, and it has many benefits that make it well worth the effort. We hope you'll learn a few new things from our guests. We are joined by two guests today who have, led, uh, who have developed successful technology plans in their library using different uh, methods. Julie Elmore is the Library Director for the Oakland City Columbia Township Public Library in Indiana, a small library that serves under 4,000 people. And as the only librarian on staff, her duties vary from reference and reader's advisory to, manage, to management and to basic IT. She is also an active board member with the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Travis is a technology specialist at the Liberty Lake Public Library located in a town of about 8,000 people located near Spokane, Washington. Along with maintaining the library's network, he also provides device support and teaches weekly computer classes. And he's very passionate about this topic and enjoys sharing it with others. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Assisting us with chat and Twitter, we have Becky Wiegand and Jenny Meese, both from the TechSoup team. And just as a reminder, we will be on Twitter, and we use the at TechSoup for Libs handle. Now throughout the webinar, we'll be sharing tools, tips, and additional resources. Uh, Julie will share her perspective on technology planning as the library director. And Travis will share his perspective from the IT side of things. Uh, we have some, some templates and some best practices to share, and we will all share resources, and I'll share some additional resources from TechSoup and other organizations. And again, all of that will be included in the archive which you'll receive following the webinar. 
We'll have time for questions throughout, so just as a reminder, please send your questions using the chat as they arise, and we will address as many as we're able to. And if you ask a question that we're not able to answer during the webinar today for any reason, we will follow up later via email with a response. Also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and all of the slides, resources, and materials will be sent out later. So we'd like to start off by knowing just a little bit about you. So tell us, what's your experience with technology planning? Does your library currently have a technology plan of some sort? Um, you can choose your response by clicking the radio button next to it, and then clicking Submit to send us your response. Send that in. All right. You can see your responses are coming in right now. And, and it looks like actually a fair amount of you do have a technology plan of some sort in place. Um, some of you do not. And, and of course some of you aren't sure. Maybe it's not in your position to um, uh, have, have dealt with that before, or maybe you're coming in new to your library. So that certainly makes sense there. I'll give you just a few more uh, seconds to respond here before we, we move on. I will say though if you're new to technology planning, then this should give you a good introduction. And if, uh, but if you have a lot of experience, I think you'll learn a few new things that you may be able to implement into your plan as well. All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to our next poll. Let me close this one. You can see our final results there. So thanks for participating. We do have one more poll because we're also curious to know, are you required to have a technology plan in your library? Um, and you know, let us know, does your state library require it, or does a funder or your board require it? Maybe you have other reasons. You can share those in the chat. And uh, you can check all that apply here. So let us know what your responses are. I know it will take you a second to think about that. And of course if you aren't quite sure, there's a, a response for you there. And it looks like actually that's one that's rising to the top is, is not, not quite sure if it's required. I know in a lot of cases maybe it's something we just have done for a long time. So absolutely. And you can see that some of you are already asking some questions in the chat, and that's great to see. I know we'll have some good time to answer those questions later on in the call. All right, so I'll give you a few more seconds to respond here before we move on because I know what you've really come to hear is to hear uh, Julia and Travis tell their experience. But i um, give you just a few more seconds here. And I'll go ahead and close the poll in 3, 2, and 1. All right, and it looks like actually you know, about a third of you uh, say that it's actually not required for you to have a technology plan. About a third of you say that you're not quite sure if it's required. And then we see a variety of reasons. The biggest reason being that uh, state libraries are requiring that. And they know in some states that is, that is the case in order to um, uh, get whatever support you get from the state library then it's required. So thanks for sharing that with us. And um, so I think at this point what I want to do is hand things over to Julie to tell us about her perspective as a library director um, on technology planning. So Julie, are you ready? I am. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, um, thank you to everybody for, uh, for having me and, and uh, letting me share our tech planning process with you. Um, I thought first maybe I'd share just a little bit about my library. As Crystal said, we serve less than 4,000 people. Um, our, we have a budget that's approved of $200,000, but we really only get in about 175000 a year. And we also have um, a staff of myself as a full-time director. We have four part-time clerks. And they average hours from 12 hours to 25 hours a week. So all combined it's less than, uh, less than two full-time equivalents. Um, and most importantly in that list you'll notice that there are no IT professionals um, on our staff. So we kind of run a little lean and a little, uh, little skeletal, but we uh, do tend to at least try to focus on the basics that our budget will allow. Also our area is fairly economically depressed. We seem to have a lot of people that may have Internet on their cell phone, but maybe not their, the computer skills to go with most of their Internet experiences through their phone. Um, you know, everybody has their reasons for why they create their tech plan. I didn't have a choice. The state said, you shall have one, so I said, okay. So I went out and um, you know, went towards creating it. But you know, in hindsight, I kind of think that the state was kind of right on this one because in reality I was, I was really kind of glad that um, it was required. 
Um, you know, the, the tech plan that we have, it kind of serves as our roadmap for where we want to go and how we want to kind of get there. Um, and we do tend to evaluate our plans pretty regularly. So it kind of keeps us on track and lets us measure our progress and see whether or not we're meeting the, the goals that, that we set out to meet. Um, our plan is a three-year plan, and when you're talking technology, my personal opinion is three years is plenty. You look back three years, and you know the iPhone 5 came out in 2012. So, you know we're already we're already a generation beyond that with the iPhone 6. Is you kind of want to three years is kind of enough in my opinion. Um, also, uh, our state library we we took advantage of some templates that our state library provided. Um, you know, that's kind of the best part about being in the library world is that we really do tend to, you know, help and support each other out a lot. So there's templates and policies everywhere, especially, you know, if you're on any sort of state listserv or if you are a member of the ARSL group and their listserv, it's a great place when you're seeking plans from those smaller libraries like, you know, like we are. Um, but, you know, when I started, I looked at what was required in the plan and then I kind of designed it and then thought about where we wanted to take it. But meanwhile, I pretty much opted to use the KISS strategy of keeping it super simple. Um, and that, that tends to work best for us. Um, we like to keep it simple because you really you, you don't want to, to get buried in the specifics. We kind of look at our tech plan more as a guide and not necessarily a hard and fast rule. So it helps us to be able to keep, the, keep a lot of the writing fairly um, simplistic. And um, you know, as I said earlier, we're lucky in our jobs. We can we can borrow from other libraries, and, and the best part about that is, you, remember, you don't have to borrow all of their plan. Just kind of use what applies to you, and, and leave. If there's too much details in it, you know, you can leave that stuff out. Um, but most of all, the simpler the plan is, the easier it is for you to kind of adapt to any sort of uh, changes in technology and such. But it definitely does take some time, and it is a process to create the, the actual plan. You know, they say Rome wasn't built in a day, and you know, neither is your tech plan. But you will need to make sure that you have a good grasp of your current inventory. If you don't really know what you already have, you're not really sure where you're going to be able to go. Um, so kind of take some time, consider the inventory, consider the direction that you'd like to go in. Maybe pick some of your uh, uh, key, you know, pick some of your pick some of the key areas. Take a look at it. No IT people in my building. That generally means that I tend to keep it to what I can do myself or what I can afford to pay out of my budget for a contractor to do. Um, so that, that's also a really good way to hone in on your key areas because there's, there's really only so much that you can do. Um, you know, of course, you want to set your goals and achievable objectives. Um, again, here's, you know, it's what I think that we can actually do here. And then begin that first draft, and do not be afraid to edit that draft along as you go, because what you first thought might be a goal, by the time you're finished with it, you may realize that you're either already doing that or that it's really not where you want to go anyway. Um, you know, in, our tech, in, in my personal tech plan or our library's tech plan, we do include our mission statement. I tend to try to include that whenever we're doing any sort of planning document. It's a real short, you know, easy reminder of what our purpose is and why we want our plans to go into a specific direction. So really if you can kind of keep that in mind, that does help. Um, of course, we took our technology inventory and we set our goals and objectives, but we also wanted to make sure that we included um, a professional development strategy and a budget to make sure we could get it done, but we also wanted to include our evaluation processes. And when it came to looking at our inventory, you know, it's really important to include not only what you currently have, but what you're proposing to have three years out. Um, you know, and when you're looking at your inventory, if you look at, you know, tend to look at everything because you might be surprised with everything that you have. And it's, you know, it's more than how many computers you might have. You know, you also have the operating systems. You also have the software. You know, there's a huge difference if you're running five computers running Windows XP and Microsoft Office 2003 versus five computers that are running Windows 10 and Office 2013. Um, so tend to take a look at, at everything that's on your computers as well. In addition, some of the peripherals that are around your building that you may not think of outside of just the basic, you know, where you have with your computers or, or your tablets. But you might want to think about, you know, your fax machines, any electronic phone systems, um, e-readers, tablets, and, and maybe even um, if you have a security camera system. You know, all that falls under your technology. And of course, you know, you want to take a look at your, um, take a look at your bandwidth. I've yet to really find the, uh, the library that has too much. So I think that, um, you know, I think that if you kind of, 
um, take, remember to take a look at that and, and plan for those upgrades. And you also want to kind of take a look at your um, your inner uh, your ILS system. Uh, if you're not happy with it and you've had it for a while, you know consider making it a goal to just you know work towards replacing that. Um, something that we did keep in mind as well when we were doing our inventory was that it's a tech inventory. It's not necessarily an insurance inventory. So while you may have another document that might have the serial numbers and all of that, for purposes of your tech um, inventory, we, we didn't bother getting into those type of details. We more wanted to know what we had and how much of it that we had. Um, we tried not to go overly specific, but you know, like and, and with with specific you know makes and model numbers. But for instance, we have a gaming system, and in 2018 we still only plan to have one gaming system. But rather specifying that we currently have a Wii, and in 2018 that we propose to have a um, you know we, we don't want to be stuck with still having a Wii if we're able to upgrade to a um, to a, a nicer unit. Um, also, when you're talking about what you have that is um, as far as proposed versus current, think about what you don't want to have anymore either. You know, in that picture, um, you can see our copier, and next to it, we have our inkjet color printer. Three years from now, we really hope to be inkjet copier free um, or inkjet printer free. Uh, so currently, our current inventory is one, but our proposed inventory is zero because we have a separate line item for an all-in-one unit with a current inventory of zero with a proposed inventory of one of that black-white color all-in-one all unit. Um, and that's really just to kind of keep us on track to remember that that is one of our goals. Uh, real quick, I did see a question about what the ILS is. Um, that's your integrated system where you have your catalog, your um, circulation, um, that sort of software. So after our inventory, we decided we are going to take a look at our goals. And take a look at. Um, you can look see the list here. These are some of the areas that we chose to focus on. Um, this really is not the place for your wild dreams. And when you're running a small library, it's kind of the place where you should include what you realistically want to get done with your technology over the next three years. Um, but also keep in mind that sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be a new goal. It is okay to maintain a certain level. You know, we are a small, smaller staff workplace. Sometimes we actually do have to accept the fact that there are limitations as far as how much more we can take on physically and financially. Um, you know, for instance, right now we have um, enough public computers that we are not really having long wait lines. Um, we plan to maintain that number, and we'll focus on updating them and replacing them. But actually, as far as increasing the number of stations, you know, our goal is to maintain where we're at right now. Um, you know, don't forget also when you're looking at your goals and your objectives to take a look at what's outside of your library. Um, our initial tech plan involved uh, building a website. That task was completed. So when we went about um, creating our, our next uh, three-year block, we uh, decided that we were going to take a look at just maintaining our website. Uh, if I had a, a dedicated person for technology, I would love to maybe you know insist upon once a year having a complete makeover to the, to the look of our WordPress theme. But I don't have that. So I have to kind of focus on what I can get done. So we're opting to maintain the current look of our website for quite a while, but utilize some plugins to make sure that it stays up to date, uh, the biggest ones being our Google Calendar plugin and our Facebook plugin. So you want to kind of make sure that you don't, don't leave out the online presence as part of your technology plan. You know, I know Travis is going to cover more on the maintenance end of your tech plan and then a little bit more in detail that, that he can give you from that perspective. But I will say that when you're taking a look at the wording, um, we really went with keeping our wording pretty simple so that it was achievable. You know, there's a line in ours that one of our goals is to keep our computers cleaned twice a year. That's it. You know, you could say January and June or April and October or whatever. But you know, when you're running the, when, when you're when you're working in the small libraries, you know, a staff, you know, something as, as simple as a staff turnover can throw you behind a good month of, of just about anything. So you want to really kind of make sure that you set yourself up for success rather than you know automatically putting yourself you know behind the eight ball, going, oh gosh, you know, I'm never going to be able to get this done. I'm failing at my goals. Uh, so that's why one of the reasons why we tend to like to keep our um, our wording realistic. And of course, like I said, we, we focus a lot on training and, and our goals. Think about where you want your patron training to go. You know, are you looking more at um, 
teaching classes? If so, how often? You know, do you want to set a quarterly goal, a monthly goal? Um, you know, how many how many of those do you want to have? When you're looking at uh, maybe one on one, do you want to make sure that you have um, you know certain certain times available where where people can come in and get that sort of help? Um, our library tends to promote patron self training. So currently one of our big goals that we're working on here within the next year is to grow and maintain a list of quality training materials for the patrons to use. And please, please, please do not forget your staff in this. You know, they cannot help the guests that are in your building if they don't know how to use the technology that you offer as well. Um, you can read here, this is a line straight out of our technology plan um, regarding professional development. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but you know, there's, there are lots of ways to accomplish this goal. You can have staff development days. You can have self-directed training at the desk. You know, different, different versions. Um, we also here in our library, we tend to use an each one teach one philosophy. When one person learns something, it's their job to pass that knowledge along and share it with a coworker. And um, a lot of times that incl in includes just writing directions in our master how to do everything file that we have on our Google Drive account. But at the end of the day, the main goal with that is to never have only one person knowing how to do anything you know, um, in your, when it comes to your technology. But also you, know, you have to be a little bit realistic and you also have to remember that you know, money, is, money is directly related to your technology plan. You have to be realistic that there's a cost associated with having technology. Uh, generally speaking, if it's, if it's required and we, have to, and we classify it as a have to have, we make sure that we can fit that into our existing budget. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't look for grants or even that you can't write something in as a goal that is grant dependent, but you really want to make sure that you're pretty clear in that 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 is a goal that you're going to go out and seek the grant to fund um, whatever it is that you're looking forward to adding to your library. And do not forget the free stuff either. You know, a lot of our staff training is free stuff, whether it comes from State library trainings, or you know, different webinars through TechSoup or Web Junction. You know, a lot of times that really only costs staff time, and, and in my case, sometimes it'll cost me a little bit of time for a commitment for me to go and cover the front desk clerk so that they can go off desk to make sure that they're learning. Um, it was a great example yesterday. We had um, one one uh, one of our clerks was taking a webinar, and as soon as she got off of that, she turned right around to another clerk and she said you need to watch this webinar. And it was great because now today there's my next clerk in there watching a webinar um, on handling um, uh, the, the technology petting zoos and, and the e-readers and, and that sort of stuff. So that was a great opportunity where, where they tend to talk amongst themselves and, and create that cross-training environment. But sometimes when you're talking money, you, you really do sometimes need to remember that sometimes it's worth it to pay the professionals for their hour or more. Um, if it's going to cost you more time and you know, in time spent, sometimes you, know, you just have to find that balance of what you can take on yourself and what you really just need to outsource. Um, and if your, if your staff is not as tech friendly as you might like them to be, you, know, you just need to keep that in mind and maybe budget a little bit more in the uh, line items for your IT services. And of course, you really do want to make sure that you evaluate your plan periodically. Um, you know, we prefer to evaluate them yearly, kind of make sure that we are um, going where we need to go and, and that we're staying on target. And sometimes as well, even checking to make sure that a goal that we have is still a necessary goal. Um, so you want to kind of take a look at it, see where you're at. Like I said, it, it, uh, um, it doesn't have to be a, a big evaluation process, but mainly just make sure that your plan is not sitting in the back of some file drawer forever, never to be seen again. That's, that's kind of a key thing. And, and of course, you know, a few things to remember as I wrap up here. Keep it realistic. You know, there, there are only so many things that you can do. And we do them well in libraries. We're used to, to running on, on um, small budgets and such. But you know, when, you're, when you are planning, you really want to make sure that you set that, that plan up as realistically as possible. And of course, you know, my favorite, just keep it, keeping it simple. Keeping it super simple, that works quite a bit. Uh, always be sure to remember to review that plan and include that in your plan, how you are going to review it and how often you're going to review it. And you know, even without having that IT professional in the building, 
your library can meet the specifications of any of the required plans. If, if you have a requirement, you can meet those. Um, and most importantly, just use that plan to create that roadmap for where you want your library to go with technology. You know, your librarians, you can do it. So that's that's about all that I had on my my end for the directors. Uh, Great. Well. Julie, thanks for sharing. That was certainly a lot actually to, to share in a short period of time. And um, so I first just want to say thank you for sharing all of your experiences with us. Thank you. Um, and, and we've had some questions come in already. And I know we maybe will have a few more come in in the next few minutes. So I wanted to go back to a couple of the things that you've said. Now, um, you mentioned um, taking a look at how much bandwidth you have. And I like that you know, you, you, the way you put it, you, you've never seen a library that had too much bandwidth. Um, and I was uh, wondering what you do. Actually, this came up from one of our um, uh, participants as well. Um, do you have any recommendations for monitoring the broadband speed, the bandwidth that you have coming into the library? Um, how have you gone about that? Well, we are very lucky. Our, we use um, ENA, Education Networks of America, through uh, to handle the bulk of our internet. And they, anytime that I want to report on how we're doing, they are able to. Ju I just email them and say, hey, can I get this report? And they will send me one. So I'm a little spoiled on that end as far as, as viewing those reports. Um, but I know a few years ago um, when they, could, they come in once a year and kind of give us the annual, this is where you're at, and we were running pretty steady with a T1 line at about, from the time we opened, we would hit 80% max capacity. Um, and then after school, of course, we were running a nonstop 95%. So at that point in time, we started looking at, okay, we need to make the switch from the one T1 line over to fiber. And that's where we're at right now with 5 megs of fiber. Great. So you were able to look at what you were using and then make the case to expand the, the amount of, of bandwidth that you had coming in then. Yeah. Um, yeah. And could you say the name of that company again? Sure. It's um, ENA. ENA, and it was what was what is the uh, education networks of America? They uh, mainly do um, libraries and schools internet connections great. for them. Great, great. And if they're not available in your area, there may be other um, organizations. To those of you listening in your area that help support library broadband, so you can check into that locally. Um, good. Well, that was that was one of the the bigger questions that came up. Um, and I also I just wanted to say that as far as the training goes, there was some conversation going on in the chat, um, and I, you know your idea of each one teach one. I just think that's a really good thing to maybe go back to for a minute. And um, you know you gave you shared a really good example of how one of your staff members has. Um, you know, learned uh, or how, how they're sharing with one another immediately. Um, but uh, you know, it seems like that's a really good way to have more informal training on an ongoing base in the, basis in the library. And I just wanted to, to know if you had any other ideas or examples you could share around that. Well, sure. Our, part of our um, training process with, with all staff is that they are required to go one hour every pay period and do some sort of self-directed training. And on, um, it, mainly because it keeps everything nice and neat, that's actually attached to their, their um, sign-in and sign-out sheet. At the bottom of it, there's a box down there to talk about their tech training. So they are, they are allowed to pick and choose from whatever topic they, they wish to, to learn more about, um, as long as they can relate it back to how they're going to use it in the library. Um, from there, I've, had, I've gotten comments as far as, meh, you know, not so much, to, you know, oh my gosh, this was great. I had no idea we could do this. And then on those ones, I tend to go back and I, and I might say, hey, can you show me how you, do, how you learn to do this so that I'm aware? And then I will also, again, um, we, we keep a master file in our Google Drive account uh, where they can um, write how-to sheets. And these are, these are sheets that we have everything. We have you know, how to scan a document and how to do this. And just yesterday, uh, well, two days ago, I'm sorry, somebody came over to me and they said, hey, you know, I need to scan this document to Computer 4 and I can't figure this out. So we went back to the Google Drive account so that we could reiterate that it's in there, printed that out, they went over, and it's step-by-step -step directions. And we normally have somebody that writes it, and then their job is to give it to somebody else, and they have to go and follow all those directions to make sure 
that the directions are very clear for each other. And that has really helped out a lot um, with making sure that, that people learn how to do things or if, if somebody or if I'm not in the building that they still have a resource to draw upon that's written very clearly by at least one or two other staff members to, to know how to, to know how to do something. Great. Great. And, and just to follow up on that, uh, uh, Monica asks if you have uh, instituted or employed any technology competencies for staff. So have you put anything out there as here are the standards for what I'd like you to know, or do they just follow their own path? They follow, they, they follow their own path. Um, I do know that there are some libraries that have you know, set competencies for their staff. Um, that might be a goal in the future, but right now we're really more focused on um, keeping it a little bit more of a relaxed, um, they, don't, they don't have to fear that they're not at that level. I want them to enjoy the process of moving forward at whatever, whatever path they choose to go down. Great, great. Well, I love that you've emphasized including training for staff in, in the plan itself. Of course, you know, we bring in all this new technology and we have to learn how to operate it in order to really be functional. So I, I love that you've prioritized that. Um, just a couple of, of uh, things for those of you who are asking about, um, uh, you know, will Julie share the, um, uh, her finished uh, 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 policy, I think you mean the technology plan here, and also the, the, the template from the Indiana State Library that she has used. And we will share both of those in the archive for this webinar, so you will have access to those. And just a reminder, if you, if you didn't uh, hear this announcement at the beginning, you'll receive an email with that archive uh, within a couple days of now. Um, so you'll get that information and be able to take a look at what she's been uh, talking about. So um, I think, uh, Julie, that's all the questions we have time for right now. So I'm going to say thank you very much for sharing what, you've, uh, what you have so far. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. And uh, we may have more t time at the end for questions with Julie. We'll uh, see how our timeline goes from here. Um, in just a minute we're going to hear from uh, Travis who is going to share the, tech, uh, the IT perspective of things. But I also wanted to share just a few resources from the TechSoup for Libraries website that you might find helpful. We have several cookbooks as we call them um, that talk about technology planning and some of the other things you need to consider when it comes to your technology especially if you're in a small or a rural library. Um, and so these guides are available at TechSoupForLibraries.org. And there are three different topics there, and you may find them all useful. They are free to download, and I will include the links for this in the archive uh, email that you'll receive shortly. Um, so that's another set of resources if you want to dive into any of these topics or look at more templates and ideas. Um, some of that is included in those cookbooks. But for now I think I'll go ahead and hand things over to Travis who is going to tell us about the IT side of things uh, from his experience at the Liberty Lake Municipal Library. Travis? Thank you, Crystal. Hi. Uh, as you know, I'm Travis Montgomery. Um, I work for the Liberty Lake Municipal Library in Liberty Lake, Washington. Um, we're about uh, 10 minutes from Spokane, Washington. Um, our population is almost about 9,000 people now. Um, we have a staff of uh, three full-time employees and uh, nine part-time staff employees, and then uh, we have several uh, volunteers. Um, we do, um, as you're speaking to me, we do have a dedicated IP person. I am that person. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, practical reasons for having a technology plan. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a big person about saving money. So um, first and foremost is saving money. Um, the best time to buy something is when you don't need it. Um, if, you're <clears throat> if you're buying items when you have an outage or you're in need, you're never going to get the better price that you could possibly do if you shop around. Um, great sites um, that we use ourselves are Lueg, TechSoup, Amazon, um, eBay. Um, a lot of people on probably on the the East Coast have probably have not heard of Fry's Electronics, but they're a, a discount electronics chain. Um, the big thing is to, like I said, shop. Um, um, I'm I'm a big proponent of spending a little extra time and saving you know hundreds if not thousands of dollars by just doing a little work. Um, so don't be afraid to to take a price and and go other places with it. Um, uh, shopping at the right time is just as important as shopping around in my opinion. Um, for technology purposes, 
Christmas time, just like for anything else, is a great time to buy. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of Cyber Tuesdays. Those that's that's their big uh, um, uh, uh, electronics uh, sale that they do on on websites like Amazon and other places. There, so um, when you buy is just as important as as uh, um, what you're buying, kind of thing. Um, preventative maintenance. This is something that um, I am really passionate about. Um, um, a lot of libraries they focus on, you know, having something new um, and staying with the the, the, the latest technologies. Um, preventative maintenance can make something last much much longer than than you had pr previously anticipated. Thus. Um, every year that you keep something longer, you're saving significant amount of money there. So some things that you can do uh, preventive maintenance wise, um, I'm a big proponent of compressed air. Um, there's a, an image right there. There's a, a computer um, before and after picture. Um, that is more of an extreme case there, but computers will get dirty. And uh, um, the whole point of, of the, the circular fan thing is to dissipate heat. Well, when the coils and other things are, are clogged with, with dust and dirt and cobwebs and other things there, they can't dissipate the heat and you have a higher failure rate than if you kept a, a nice, cool, clean computer. Um, if you look at the picture, we have, um, we have uh, um, uh, a can of compressed air. But we also, um, at our library, um, if you look at the, the vacuum, the, the data vac, um, we use one of those. Um, compressed air um, over time is great, but it gets expensive and it's not as powerful. So for about 60 bucks, you can buy one of these vacs that uh, push much more air, um, and you never have to buy another can of compressed air. So um, that's a great way to save money and keep your computers clean. Um, another thing, um, this is a, a printer thing that a lot of libraries don't think about is printer maintenance. Um, again, compressed air is, is utilized to, to clean it out, but uh, um, a lot of people don't think about the rubber wheels that push the paper. Um, I'm sure just about anybody that's worked in a library has dealt with paper jams. Um, it's, it's a common occurrence, and um, that right there comes down to dust on the wheels, um, on the ru rubber wheels, but it also comes down to rubber over time will harden and crack. Um, and uh, not be able to push the paper. The, the rubber is what grips the paper and pushes it through. So um, they have the spray called rubber rejuvenator where you can actually just you spray it on like a cloth and then you rub it on there and it actually gets your rubber softer and um, back to its original state and thus prevent, prevent uh, paper jams. So um, that's another inexpensive thing that you can do. Um, and uh, um, save you know tons of money over over time over printer repair or printer replacement. Um, another basic that most people are aware of surge protectors, um, um, uninterrupted power supplies or UPSs are something that uh, um, every library, if they have their own server, should be utilizing. Um, if there's a power outage, the nice thing is it it uh, gives you a, a window of anywhere from five to to an, five minutes to an hour to properly shut a computer down, or um, if the power comes back on within within that time frame, not have any data degradation or um, you know have any outages that can damage hardware. So um, those are two things that are are um, very important. Um, now we'll get into um, some of the software side. Um, Kiosk software <coughs> is something um, I, I heard Julie talking about. You know, a couple times a year they clean out the computers. Um, a great way to protect yourself is to lock down your computers. Kiosk software like Deep Freeze, Drive Vaccine, Reboot Restore RX, or um, are, are programs wherein they do an image of your hard drive. So every time you restart your computer, it takes it back to a factory state. So you can have somebody come in and, and do their worst damage, mess up every computer. You do a simple restart, and the computer is just like the day you had it. Um, you have what's called a baseline that you set up, so you can still do critical updates um, and uh, um, and uh, um, you know um, antivirus and what have you there. But by doing this, they can't mess up the operating system and thus uh, minimizing your downtime and saving you having to pay a technician or somebody else out to come and fix things there. So I'm a big fan of Kiosk software. Um, another program that is kind of being, um, being um, phased out is Steady State. Um, 
Um, it was designed for XP um, or Vista. Um, we actually still use it in our library. Um, if you run a 32-bit operating system of Windows 7, um, you can run Steady State, and we use that for some of our patron PCs instead of using the, the drive vaccine um, or the reboot re restore. Um, the reason for it is um, you have controls um, over what programs they can operate. Um, um, for us, uh, uh, with, with the drive vaccine or, or any of the other programs, um, you don't have as much control about locking the computer down. Um, for us here, we had an issue where um, patrons would use um, Craigslist, which everybody wants to and, and, and use and love, um, but um, there's also a section called pra Craigslist Personals. Um, so um, we wanted to be able to block those um, and allow you to be able to use something else. Well, um, the only browser that we have found that we can lock down and choose what's called a whitelist on or a blacklist is um, Firefox. So um, by utilizing steady state, we can actually decide what programs the, the user can use, and then uh, um, we can go in there and um, we can block certain parts of the website, not the entire Craigslist, just the personal section. That way we don't have you know, racy pictures being shown there. So um, that's a great resource that we utilize. Um, software and updates, Julie, you know, um, she, she touched on this for a little bit. Um, big thing is, is critical updates and, and antivirus definitions. They will keep your computer protected and, again, save you time in the future. So I won't spend too much time on that. Um, what do you do if you don't have access to an IT guy? Um, it sounds like mostly you don't um, or, or mixed. Um, there's a number of different things that you can do. Um, search engines. Um, as, as an IT person there, I could not do my job without Google or Bing or what have you. Um, nobody knows everything. So, um, and even if you, you've learned it in the past, you don't utilize everything every day. So I use search engines to do my job every single day. Um, the big thing is knowing what question to ask. Um, um, the, the proper way to ask the question is just as important as, as, as uh, what the question is. Um, Microsoft IT Academy, um, I don't know if every state um, um, has access to this. Um, here in Washington State, we have access to it, and um, it's a great um, personal-based training um, uh, resource that uh, um, allows you to go in there and set courses on whatever you want, be it Office, be it um, just basic uh, um, computing or, or operating systems. You go in there, and it's self-based training, and it's really, really quite wonderful. Um, How-to books. Uh, we all work in libraries, so we have access to books. Um, if your library doesn't, um, through interlibrary loans, um, there are tons and tons of, of how-to books. And I just chose some examples of you know, the you know, computers for dummies there. There is a ton of information out there. All you got to do is just look for it. Um, YouTube is, is something, um, it's not just for watching funny cat videos. Um, YouTube is a great resource for, for how to open up a computer or, or how to, um, if you're trying to utilize um, a function in Excel, you know, go in there and ask a question and you'll find most of the time people have actually taken the time to demonstrate exactly how to do it. So if you're not, um, if you don't learn as well reading something, there's tutorial videos for just about anything that you could possibly think of, and um, they're really quite helpful. Um, networking. Um, communicate with other libraries, um, you know, be it through your, you know, your, your annual library meetings or what have you. Um, there's forums. There's message boards. Um, networking is it's not just for, for computer talk. Get a partnership with like libraries. Um, get uh, uh, Get a, a plan. Uh, you know, you find a library that does something that you like. Don't be afraid to copy it. Um, you don't have to do it exactly, but um, you know, get a partnership with with other other libraries, and you'll be surprised at the information that you can get. Um, and you'll find out, you know, inexpensive ways to do things that you're wanting to do. Um, community outreach. Um, I believe Melissa had a um, said something about she had a volunteer. Um, from uh, um, from um, like a college or something, come and train. Um, here in Liberty Lake, we're, we're really lucky. This is a, um, um, a a big technology town, so we have lots of people that we can lean on for things like that. 
ask around. There's, I guarantee in the high schools and in the colleges around your library, there's plenty of tech kids that would love to spend some time and do things. And they could you know, utilize it as you know, school extra credit or what have you. But um, there's lots of people around that have technology backgrounds that would love to you know, give some of their time back to the community. So that's a great resource. It, it can definitely go both ways. Um, let's go into replacement schedules. Um, schedules are, are, are one of the things that every single library is going to be different. Um, it, the biggest thing is it's going to come down to budget and, um, and need. Um, so, so make your schedule your own. Um, you know, again, go, go into the networking. Communicate with other libraries. Get the ideas that you like, but then make it for your own library because they could have a totally different budget than you have, or you know they have a different direction that that library wants to go. So um, you know make it yours, and don't be afraid to make it evolve over time. You know um, most libraries over time their budgets increase, and um, technology is not going anywhere. It's just going to get bigger and bigger. So um, you know audit it every year, and you know don't be afraid to to reach for the stars. Um, you know uh, that um, that's the best plan I found so far. Um, the Liberty Lakes Technology Plan. Um, we actually don't have um, a, a rule that we have to have a technology plan, and um, we actually don't have a written technology plan. Um, what, what we have at our library is um, um, I have a really good partnership with our director. Um, her name is Pamela Mogan, and we, we sit and we talk, and she gives me a direction that she'd like the library to go, and sometimes you know, I have to you know, tell her, well, that, that might be a little more money than we want to spend, um, and vice versa. You know, I'll have a direction that we want to go, and she has to tell me otherwise. So um, it's a collaborative effort, and um, I, I think that if you have a, um, a, an IT person, good communication is paramount. So um, you know, have a partnership. Um, don't be afraid to you know, give some suggestions and you know, um, get them from, from your director as well. So um, I think that uh, a partnership is the best way for our library to do that. Um, other than that, that, uh, that was my presentation. I'm, I'm a bit of a fast talker and, and I go through information a little bit faster, so um, I wanted to have ample time for people to ask questions there. So uh, I will uh, um, give it over to Crystal. Great. Well, thank you, Travis. And we certainly have had a lot of questions coming in, so we will get to as many of these as we can. Um, I want. Let's see. Where where would be a good place to start? Um, one of the things that was coming in, um, and I just maybe want to touch on it. Oh, let's go back here. Um, I want to. You know, I want to just touch on this because there was some interest in the chat about um, IT Academy, which was a resource which you had mentioned, um, and the question was whether or not it was free. And so I just wanted to um, kind of clarify that for everybody. And, you know, it's not a free tool, but it is one. Um, Travis is from Washington State, and their state library has purchased a um, access for all libraries in the in the state and and worked out a deal there. So it's possible that your state or someone else in your area might have access for you. Um, but you can use another similar tool. A few others that have been mentioned that have similar types of training include uh, Lynda.com, which sometimes has a state library level subscription or a regional consortia subscription. Also, um, as free tools like GCF Learn Free have been mentioned in the chat. So those are some of the different uh, training resources you might have if you're trying to learn more about this. Um, and then Travis, one of the other things that you had mentioned was just asking questions in Google to learn as you have questions that arise. And you said that it was really important to ask the right question. And I don't know if you might be able to give us an example of something where you know, maybe we might commonly ask it one way, but the best way to ask it in a search engine would be you know, when, when it comes to IT types of questions. Do you have any examples? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, a great thing is, say you're um, the example I used earlier. Say you're looking to do some, something in Excel or Word. So, say you want to learn how to, you know, properly space um, after sentences in Word. Um, you don't just um, when you're doing a search, you're not going to just say word spacing. Um, you'll get, you know, information and um, results back that are just not going to help you, and you'll have to weed through so much. Um, but what you do is, you know, how to Space, um, how to change the spacing after sentences in Microsoft Word. Um, and um, that is a great way to do it. Another, um, another way to ask proper questions in, in Google is, is to use quotes. 
Um, and that way it doesn't just search words, it will search all the words inside your quotes there. So you will get much better results doing it that way. Great. And, and based on what you're saying, I'm, I'm imagining the types of results you're going to get are um, like forums where people have asked a, a very similar question, and then you can see responses from IT experts on the Internet. Is that kind of what you, you're getting at here? Absolutely. Well, and, and there's tons of, you'll find um, you know, just a myriad of websites where, where people have asked the same question. Um, you'll get um, you know, like Yahoo Answers. Um, you'll get um, a, a myriad of different things. But you'll also, um, touching on what I talked about earlier, ya uh, um, YouTube. Um, quite often if it's something that you know, um, you, you're just not sure and you don't want to do you know, um, three hours of reading, sometimes you do your search and then put YouTube at the end of it, and you'd be surprised how many people take the time to do videos on exactly what you're asking. Great, great. Um, now maybe to move to a slightly different topic, we've had several questions relating to the topic of kiosk software or like the deep freeze and, and the, the various programs that can be used to protect your computer. One question uh, was that if you're using something like Deep Freeze, do you also still need to use a virus protection or security software on the computer? Do you need to double up on that? Most, most, um, most still do that um, because um, there's times when you still need to do your updates of the baseline. Um, so it is suggested to still use a, 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 an antivirus program. Um, it also comes down to um, you can set up different, different times for it to restore. Um, at, at our library, I have it set up to every time the person logs off, it restores it. That way you're not seeing the searches of the previous person or what have you. Um, but the deficiency of that is you, you do have the, the slow, you have the downtime of the computer restarting and coming back up. And um, this software does slow down um, the computers there. So um, if you have heavy traffic, maybe that's not as ideal. If you, um, for our library, we have we have about 12 patron PCs, so it's rare that we're, we're you know, anywhere near full. Um, so we can have a little more time between um, people logging off and, and allowing the computer to restart. But if you're in a library that you only have, you know, say, three patron PCs and you know, you've got people waiting, that may frustrate some people that you're going to have to wait you know, three minutes or so for it to, to restart and, and come back up. And that also comes down to, um, you know, to, to hardware. Um, if you've got newer, faster computers, it will definitely come up faster. But most libraries don't have you know, cutting edge you know, i7 processor, um, beefy computers for their patrons. So um, speed will even be a more, uh, more of an issue when, when they're older computers. Right. Right, so many things to consider. <laughs> um, well, and then maybe another uh, little bit more technical question um, related to the maintenance of computers. And this maybe will just help clarify that um, air compressor uh, that you were sharing with us. Kelly asks if you use that data vac um, only on the ex like through the back of the computer, or if you should take the computers apart. And actually, that's a really good question because I think the images we saw were of kind of the insides of the computers, which you know were pretty dusty. So, what sure. do you recommend for that? Well, um, just to, to elaborate on the data vac, it's not an actual vacuum. It pushes air. So I don't know why they came up with the name data vac. I, I think that's kind of a misnomer. It's it's a blower. Essentially, it's it, it, it's you know putting out compressed air. Um, you definitely want to open it up. Um, I know a lot of people are are you know um, afraid of open up a computer, make sure they're breaking it. The big thing when you work on these things is to unplug it. <coughs> Never have power to these things there because. Um, the power supplies and, and some of the capacitors can absolutely you know, kill people there. So, um, and I'm not trying to you know, put fear in anybody, but anytime you're going to open something up, make sure it's unplugged, powered down. Um, but usually you just need a Phillips head screwdriver or some of, them, some of the sides will just pop off on some of the Dells and other brands. And then you're just doing a visual search um, and you're just looking for, for massive dust. Usually that, um, that big circular thing, that's the, that's the heat sink and fan for the, for the CPU. 
that's going to be usually the dirtiest one there. Um, the big thing is you don't want to um, push all the air directly on it. Um, the uh, the the fans on these things use ball bearings, and if you um, some like the data vac, it pushes a significant amount of air, so you can actually damage the fan. So don't you know just push it on there and have that sp fan spinning a million miles an hour. Um, just get it around there and, and you know um, push out all that air. The, the cleaner it is, I, I guarantee you the cooler it's going to work. Um, another people thing people don't realize is. Um, Hotter computers run slower than cooler computers. So you'll get actually more performance the cleaner it is. So um, it goes hand in hand. But uh, um, just make sure it's unplugged and, and open it up and um, just clean it out is, is what I would suggest. Great, great. Now, uh, kind of a more forward-thinking question. Um, and uh, Travis, I'll put this to you first, and then uh, Julie, maybe I'll have you come on and respond as well. Um, Pamela asks, what do you think the future of the desktop computer is? And should we be looking more to replacing them with tablets and, and laptops as those desktops get a little bit older? So Travis, what's your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, and um, I answered that question. Um, for me, um, I am a big proponent of desktops. I know a lot of people think that everything is going to laptops, it's going to tablets, um, but you still see the patrons need to sit down. They're going to be um, working at their screen. The advantage of, of desktop PCs um, are, are, are twofold. Um, one, you can have a faster desktop than any laptop or tablet that you can have. Also, the upgradability. Um, me personally, I, I do not like um, a lot of libraries are converting over to what's called all-in-ones, where um, the, the computer, everything's built into the, to the monitor. Um, we had a bunch of those when I came into our library, and I absolutely hate them because you are very limited in what you can do to upgrade them. Also, they're very tight in space, so they tend to have more heat issue. Um, so I am a big proponent of desktops. Um, I, um, I hope they don't go away anytime soon, and there shouldn't be because um, if you're, you're doing things like uh, be it CAD or, or you know, Photoshop, you need a, a higher end PC. Um, so you, you're, you're going to utilize desktops for a long time to come. And the big advantage of a desktop is, is upgradability. So um, I don't foresee them going away anytime soon um, until, um, you know, until they come up with super fast laptops and, and tablets for that matter. Great. Thanks for uh, responding to that and giving a little bit more detail there. And Julie, um, from your perspective as a library director, where do you see this headed? Um, in, and maybe in your library, how are you thinking of it? Well, I tend to agree with Travis on this one, um, mainly because I still have so many people who come in with things that are on their tablets or things that are, they're coming in going, I need to print this and it's on my phone. How do I get to it? Or, or somebody emailed me this and I need to print it, but you know you can't print from, from this. Um, so I kind of think that the desktops are, are going to be here for a while. Um, ourselves, as far as my tech plan goes, we, we make sure that we budget no less than one computer every year to be replaced, um, hopefully two. And they normally get purchased. Um, I kind of kind of carbon what Travis said earlier. You know that Black Friday sale is, is uh, generally when you know it's close to the end of my fiscal year, and I know whether or not I can get one, whether I can get two. But we always try to make sure that um, that we have at least a couple new ones a year, and, and we still are looking at at, um, at desktops. And, and you know a lot of times, honestly, the price is still pretty right when it comes to to buying those desktops. So from from our from our perspective, we, we still think that um, we still we still tend to go with, towards the desktops. Great. Also, Great. Well, if I could um, go on one other thing there, um, um, when it comes to purchasing PCs, um, I see it all the time. Um, libraries and other places go out and they purchase higher end machines, um, thinking that they're going to you know be faster, longer, and, and that is true to a point. Um, but I, I see a lot of places, you know, um, I was at a library the other day, and um, uh, this may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but I see computers with higher end processors, be it i7 or i5 processors, being utilized for things like um, self-checkout um, or patron PCs. Um, I, I think that that's a huge waste. So the way you spend this, your money is just as important. You don't, if, if, if you're just looking for a patron PC or, or like I said, a self-check PC, you don't need a cutting-edge processor. You don't need to go out and spend $800 on a machine. 
go out and buy, you know, spend three hundred dollars or, or, or four hundred dollars and get two machines. Um, so spending your money wisely is 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 really important. And Travis, I think that's really good advice. I have to cut in here because we're just about out of time, and I want to make just a few announcements before we go. But I think that was a great uh, thing to put out that at the end. It's important to know what you need the technology for and make those decisions. And technology planning can certainly help you work through that process. So. Um, you know, really, I appreciate uh, Travis and Julie everything you've had to share today. Uh, we have a few unanswered questions, and I just want you to know if we didn't get to your question, we will respond via email. And I also will say that we have another webinar coming up in September that may answer some of those questions as well. So you may want to tune in for those, and I'll give you more information on that in just a minute. Um, just a few other resources that I'll share again in the archive as well. Um, our friends at Web Junction also have some resources on technology planning and lead. The, uh, uh, one of the uh, ALA affiliates has a guide on technology planning for small and one-person libraries. Idealware has a technology planning training which is available through a TechSoup donation, uh, product donation program. And then uh, there's also a webinar archive on tactical technology planning that was from a few months ago that we will share. Um, if you haven't already done so, I hope you'll visit TechSoupForLibraries.org and sign up for our email newsletter and see what blog posts and other resources we have there to share. Um, again, we do have some upcoming webinars, one on Adobe InDesign taking place tomorrow, uh, one on Windows 10 uh, taking place on August 27th, and then one on managing mobile devices, especially for library device checkout where we'll talk about both e-readers and tablets, and that's coming up on September 16th. And we have just posted the registration page for that. Um, I just want to uh, ask you to stay on the line for one more minute. We'll have a survey for you to take. But thank you to um, our presenters again for sharing their knowledge with us today. Thanks to our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk. And thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.